somewhere different. Ooh, got a flying cursor. Uh, I must admit, it's a little bit strange for me. I, I've been doing the classes for um, 19 years now, almost 20 years. Who here is 20 years old or younger? Anybody? <laughs> so, <laughs> and then there's a few periods where I was even doing them every day, seminars and workshops and all that. And in all that time, I have never once done a PowerPoint. Shut up. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see how it goes. All right. Hit me with the first slide there, Antonio. Oh. So, so this gentleman, this is a Shiva Baba. Uh, these are Rudraksha beads. You can see they chant on these beads. And this white dust is from the uh, crematorium guts. They actually go where the bodies are burning, and they take the ashes that are made from the dead bodies, and they put them on themselves. Reminds them of the temporary nature of this world. <laughs> this, this beautiful image was found by Gracie, who's got a real talent for finding these. <laughs> <Woo! laughs> they have at least one dedicated fan, Grace. <laughs> so one thing we can say about yoga, I'm sure most of you know, it's not, a, it's not just the asanas, you know, the postures. It's a whole life. It's a whole lifestyle. And one obviously very important thing is, uh, is our bodies, our, even our emotions, like our glandular system, our endocrine system, our energetic system, our whole body here is our tool for, is our vehicle for love. And it's also uh, deeply affecting our experience. And this body, as that old idiom goes, is basically made of the food that we eat. So we can tremendously shift our experience of being in a material body, being in a human form in this world, by how we choose to eat can dramatically shift what we do and how we think. So, hit me with the next slide there, Antonio G. I'll come up with some shortened version of saying that. Ah. Oh. <laughs> so, who here has heard of Sattva Rajas Tamas? You know this kind of three modes of nature. Okay. So, these in Western culture, we first learn about this from Pythagoras. Who's heard of Pythagoras? Who had to do that in school? You know, the A squared plus B squared equals C squared? <laughs> so, although he's famous now for math, for geometry, uh, in his day, he was more famous for running spiritual communities, healing something like yoga, philosophy, just like this, very much like this. And the people who are famous, like Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, who all came after him, uh, were very much influenced by Pythagoras. So, what we learn from ancient Western culture is they had the exact same knowledge. Sattva, Rajas, Tamas. They called it uh, gold, silver, and bronze, or sometimes gold, silver, and iron. It's a kind of state of energy that we find everything in. So if we go to a busy kind of, I always think of that the way the stock market was, like back in the 80s and 90s, they show a photo of it, there's like a thousand guys in a room all screaming and holding up little tickets, I don't know what they do, you ever seen that? Or am I, yeah, ah, and you know, their whole life is on the line because they, they need to sell at a certain price or buy it, it's passion, that energy, uh, driven, excited, feverish, material, ambition, greed, ah, go-getter. It's not all bad. Uh, there's definitely lower energies than that. We call that rajasic energy, or passionate energy, or Plato called it silver, the silver mode. There's also good things in there, like courage, and heroism, and power, and determination. is also in that kind of mode. Lower than that, we have, in Sanskrit, they say tamas, and 
Plato would say iron. Uh, Thomas is kind of dark, uh, madness, sloth, laziness, hate, um, inappropriate anger, uh, deep depression, addiction, all this kind of very dark kind of energy. Sometimes even you see somebody or you see something, you know, and it has that kind of feel to it. You notice that? You can just pick up energy just from, or you see like Luisa's face, you just get sattva, boom, she smiles, you see all the white teeth, oh. <laughs> so these energies, according to the ancient world, or even in India today, even in South Asia today, but in the ancient world it was more widespread, these energies pervade everything. If we work, we will work in one of these modes or in a mixture of these modes. If we eat, we will, we will eat either in sattva and rajas or tamas or a mixture. If we give charity, if we are determined in a particular way. Sometimes we notice we have some determination and it's not feverish, but it's very steady, very cool. And we keep our cool and we maintain our discipline, whatever that is and we kind of effortlessly uh, do what we set out to do. Other times we get very excited, and then maybe we fail, or maybe we do it at a really sort of extreme level. And then other times our determination is more like procrastination. Like occasionally, my alarm clock goes off, and I hit that button that makes it go off later. Snooze. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you do that a few times. And I know I would be happier if I get up right now, click, <laughs> I do that like three or four times and then finally, all right, Madrea, my, the other half of me wins. So <laughs> these energies pervade everything. They pervade places. They pervade mm, the way we speak, everything, everything, the whole, just like three colors make up everything, the three primary colors, and you mix them up. You have white and black also, but you have the three primaries. You know this, right, many of you? Uh, what is it, red, blue, and yellow? And you mix them all and they make all the other colors, if you have white and black as well. So just like the colors, that's kind of all the colors there are. But by mixing them, you get all the other colors. Similarly, this is all the kind of states of energy that we perceive in ourselves and others and places and activities and things. Anyway, so we won't go too much into this because uh, Greta is putting together a class that's all about this. But it's suffice to say... In the yoga of food, there are many things we could talk about. We will talk about four things today. Uh, the first is sattva, to choose high energy food. And you can see that just from looking uh, or feeling. Anyway, we won't spend too much time. Antonio, hit one more there for me. So, when Krishna talks about food in the Gita, he mentions ayur. I think that's the first thing he says. Who here has heard of Ayurveda? Very cool. So, ayur just means, literally it means longevity. You know, just live a long time, how to live a long time. Veda means knowledge. So, Ayurveda, the knowledge of how to live a long, healthy life. That's basically all that means. So, when we approach food, uh, there is an individual aspect to it also. And really, if we ask ourselves, Deepak Chopra recommends this. When you're looking at food, when you're thinking about food, you just ask yourself, you ask your heart, is this good for me? <laughs> and then, no, and we eat it anyway, or whatever. <laughs> uh, it's good for me right now, it may not be good for me later. <laughs> we can start to, if we want to live a spiritual life or a yoga life or a life that is connected in love to uh, in all our relationships, relationships with ourselves, with each other, with the universe, like that. If we want to move into that yoga life, spiritual life, Vedic life, then we may want to start to become more mindful, more conscious of how we eat and think of it in, in terms of, um, will this give me a long, healthy life? And also, actually, the word for eating in Sanskrit it kind of means consuming. Sometimes they even mention through the eyes or through the ears and use the same word. Like in a sense, we, cons we consume visual impressions. Somebody said to me yesterday, 
Uh, when you see something, you can never unsee it. Anyway, somebody made a, a joke that was a little bit, maybe not psychic, and then he was going, no, no, now that impression is in my brain. When we see things, that also is a type of consumption. When we hear, it's a type of consumption. Anyway, they talk like that. Also like drinking, smoking, injecting, all these kind of things. I guess even like smells, so many things. So we can surround ourselves if we want, if we want to head into that kind of energy. If we want to be uh, a certain type of person, then we may become mindful about uh, what we see, what we hear, what we smell, who we're with, the places we visit. We may start to think like that because it will affect us. We will consume that in a way. Hit us with the next one, Antonio. Gandhi. Hello, sir. So, in the South Asian tradition, these first three, we're going through four principles today. The first three are very quick. This is the third. And then we'll get into some interesting things, some uh, videos. So, hingsa means harm or violence. And ahingsa, just like in English, uh, the a uh, sort of makes the opposite. So, non-violence is the general translation. In South Asia, they have two approaches, basically, historically, if you look over the last, say, 3,000 years, two historical approaches to how to uh, be non-violent as we approach food. Now, why is this a question at all? The problem is, in Sanskrit, they say, jivo jivasya jivanam, uh, like we have jiva juice. Anybody here had a jiva juice? I, except when I'm doing watermelon, I have like four a day. Jiva means life. So jiva jivasya jivanam means life is life for the living. What that means is we have found ourselves in a particular situation as we sort of woke up in a baby's body and have progressed since then where these bodies cannot eat these rubber yoga mats or this camera or this phone or this... Uh, eco-friendly paint that we put on the walls or the cement, we can only eat organic matter. We have a right to live and we have a right to live healthy, but we find that we also want to be uh, loving to living entities around us. So we find ourselves in this life in a kind of quandary. We must eat the bodies of living entities to survive. Jiva Jivasya Jiva Nam. You guys okay? <laughs> but we don't want to do anybody any harm. So we find this, this is a little dilemma. So they have approached this in South Asia in two distinct ways. The main way, in what we now sort of loosely refer to as Hinduism, has been uh, to first not kill highly sentient creatures. Like say we wouldn't we might get hungry, but we might not decide to kill Clara. Because <laughs> we think, oh, we love Clara, we don't want to hurt her. We think like that. Uh, <laughs> and then they think, well, there's other highly sentient living entities. Like, say, in India, you might have cows, monkeys, elephants, things like that that show very uh, powerful intelligence, actually. I don't have time in this class, but I'll tell you some stories from my time when I was living in India. Uh, where I had those kind of experiences, where you just realize for certain you're dealing with a person. They may have fur, or they may be much bigger than me, or whatever, but they are a person. Thinking, feeling person. Just has four legs or whatever. So they sort of cross animals off the list, and birds and reptiles and insects, and they go, all right, at least according to their philosophy, both in Buddhism, Jainism, the Shramana movements, Hinduism in general, they feel, or they, uh, mm, from their perspective, they understand. From our perspective, we may say they believe. From their perspective, they feel that it's a kind of scientific evidence. But we can leave that for now. That let's take all the highly sentient creatures off the list. Let's limit ourselves to plants and to milk-based products from protected cows. The idea is we can get milk or cheese or butter or milkshakes or yogurt or whatever, 
from cows, and if we take care of those cows, then nobody has to get hurt. If you love the cow, the cow is happy, and you're taking care of the cow, cows do better in good care than they do in the wild, and then uh, the cows naturally don't drink all the milk, so we can take that and then nobody is hurt. You could say the cow is eating grass, the grass is hurt, then it becomes milk, then we eat it. You could say something like that, but at least this is their idea. We're not here to say it's right or wrong or we should do this or not, but at least we can see from their perspective why they've come to this conclusion. So milk products and then vegetarian products. Furthermore, they do another, historically, it's, it's falling apart now in India, but historically, they also would never eat food without offering it, without trying to express some sort of gratitude for uh, Mother Nature, for perhaps the Divine, for God, or for the living entities who say we're eating a carrot, that was a living thing, and now we are eating it, and they express gratitude for that, they have prayers and different rituals depending on their traditions. They have this whole sort of way of approaching this. It's a little bit similar to American Indian ways, actually. Uh, now the other style in South Asia is mostly now only done by the Jains. Has anybody ever heard of Jainism? There's about eight or nine million of them left. There used to be, a few centuries ago, a, a competitor to Buddhism. They used to be sort of on the same level, many, many, many uh, followers, but they've reduced uh, over time. So Jains, they look at it even more... Uh, you'll often see them wearing those white masks because they want to reduce the amount of micro, microscopic creatures, bacteria, whatever, that they kill by breathing. They're, they reduce the amount of fire that they use because every time we light a fire in any situation, um, we understand there's living entities everywhere, all over our, everywhere, right? So they're, they're thinking on that level. They're trying to minimize. They prefer foods like fruit, and they'll even do things like wait till the fruit falls. So nobody was hurt, nobody, there was no violence at all. Now this is impossible to go that far, because every step we take, every breath we take, like the Sphinx song, uh, unfortunately we kill. But still, they really take it very seriously to reduce. So that's Jane's. Uh, that's their approach to Ahimsa. And certainly, you know, meat and things like that are, are off the cards for them. Antonio, hit us with the next one. Are you okay, sir? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> no problem. So this is the thing that we'll focus on today. This is called Kritagya. And this is a very prominent principle in the Vedic tradition. Now, Krita, this word is... Uh, Anybody heard of Kriya Yoga, Action Yoga? So, Krita comes into English as create, or as that crease word, increase, decrease, like that. You okay? Yeah. <laughs> and Gya goes into Greek and Latin as Gnosis. Anybody ever heard of that? Gnosis, or the Gnostics, or Agnostic, one who doesn't know. And it comes into English as knowledge, knowledge. So, the idea is to know what has been done, to feel what has been done for us. Do you understand? Like if somebody does something for me, and I feel that, I really, I know that, I, I'm thinking of it, ah, they did this for me, it is very similar to the English word gratitude. It creates that kind of energy. Now I must give back, if I'm a decent human being, if I want to exchange love. Now this principle of Jagya, or, or Kritagya, interestingly enough, is the most emphasized principle in yoga. So after all the do-nots and the do's and the meditations and the prayers and the rituals and all the things, this particular thing and what comes out of it, uh, the word is Jagya in Sanskrit, is the most focused thing. Even if you take, say, the Gita and look at how many times Krishna talks about jagya or offering, uh, very, very prominent, very powerful process. Basically, from the ancient tradition of yoga, to be spiritual or to be, to be a materialist or a spiritualist hinges on this principle. If you are focused on offering back 
to yourself, to those around you, to the universe, and to God from their perspective. Uh, if, if, that's your, if that's a concern of yours, if you are conscious like that, if you are very aware of what someone is doing for you and you are reciprocating with them, there's never a thought of take. There's just a thought, the life is give life. I'm giving, I'm giving, I'm giving. Naturally, we are trusting that we will receive what we need also. But there's a difference between receiving and taking. Different energy, different feel, different effect. Everything different. This is the hinge from their perspective. A materialist is trying to take. That is their focus. And a spiritualist is trying to give. Very simple and very profound. Hit us with the next slide. Ooh. I love that slide. So, <laughs> isn't that nice? That's a crazy one. Crazy is empowered to find beautiful photos. So, the Sanskrit here is Avam Prapartam Chakram. Anybody heard the chakras? No, tick, 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 like this. Because they're circular, they're called chakras, wheels, discs, circles, like that. That's that word, chakra. So, to keep the circle turning, and this is Krishna says, by keeping the circle turning in the Gita, uh, one becomes happy. Two things are prominent. One becomes happy and one becomes wise. These are the gifts. So to keep the circle turning is this idea. We are focused on giving. Of course we receive, and the more you give, the more you see. The universe just, abundance is coming to you. You don't have to worry about it. You can trust it. You just give. You just focus on love. And then you see, because everybody is actually like us. They're all very nice people. <laughs> As a general rule. <laughs> they will also give back. The universe will give back. Like this. Now, there is one difference in the ancient world that we don't have today. And we will um, get into that in one more slide. Antonio G? Oh, you okay, sir? All good. Another nice photo by Grace. <laughs> so, I'll do this one, I'll illustrate this one with a story. Where is Grace? Hi, Gracie. So let's say Gracie and Antonio, who will be cooking Sunday for us. Um, ah! <laughs> Everything good. Everything's cool. So, let's say Gracie and Antonio, after this class, they go to the kitchen and they make an agreement. Uh, I was going to say cook, but maybe they will cut watermelon or whatever they're doing. They will make some food together. And let's say out of the two of them, Antonio does most of the work. And Grace is chatting with her friends and helping Antonio a little bit and then dancing and then listening to some music and then chatting and then helping a little bit also. So Antonio is doing most of the work and Gracie's helping, but they are co-creating lunch together for themselves. And then they sit down together at that nice wooden table. I uh, can't remember that boy's name, but he made that table. One, one nice Danny. volunteer. What was his name? Danny. That's oh, right. How do you say it properly in Italian? Danny. Uh, it was like Daniele or something like yes, that. Yes, Daniele. Yes, Daniele. <laughs> something like that. He made that table for us. So, Gracie and Antonio, sorry for that little tangent, <laughs> sit down at the table and they have all their watermelon cut out and beautiful little swans and stars and hearts and rainbows and dolphins and whatever else they do. And they're just about to eat it. And then Gracie takes it all. And she ignores Antonio and she eats it all. And Antonio is crying. He's getting angry. Ah, oh, he's telling people, look at this. <laughs> but Gracie ignores him and she eats it all. I know you'd never do that, Gracie. She's always doing that. <laughs> How would we feel about if that happened? Like, what would we think about uh, a person if they did that? Gracie would never do that. They're selfish. They're selfish, maybe they're rude. Like a thief, like they're stealing my food, or something like that, right? Not good, not nice behavior. In exactly that way, 
all over the ancient world, from pagan Europe to the Americas, to Russia, to China, to South Asia, to Japan, everywhere, everywhere. Like, uh, who here has read Homer, the Iliad and the Odyssey, or seen the movie Troy? <laughs> Either way. <laughs> so, in Homer, you see, nobody ever eats or drinks anything without offering it. In the ancient world, it was considered that there is a divine hand, divine, mm, there's personal divinity, let's say, because they have different ideas. Some people are thinking it's God or the goddess or goddess and God. Some people are thinking it's the gods, you know, like this, like Homer is thinking it's the gods. Uh, but somebody, we are not making the rain. We are not, we are not mother nature. We are not making the earth. We can't make a seed. We can't make the sunshine. We're not doing all these things. We're not making the beautiful moon flow in the sky. And if you become a farmer, you'll notice as the moon shifts, all your plants shift. We're not in control of any of that. Most of, the, most of this work of growing food is done by somebody else. So they think to sort of co-create food by growing it or picking it off a tree or cooking it or whatever with Mother Nature. And then at the end, to ignore Mother Nature and just to eat it ourselves is exactly like that. Now we may think that's, we may gel with that idea right away, just resonate with it. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Or we may not get it at all. But regardless, the entire ancient world thought like this. You cannot just take. You can't just walk up to a tree and take fruit and eat it. I mean, you can, but that's stealing. That's not your tree. That's not from you. Somebody grew that for you. There is all sorts of living entities. The tree also is a person. And Tony, you're messing with my dramatic points. <laughs> <laughs> they thought like that. So they would then, basically all over the ancient world, if you look at the Bible when Paul starts to travel, or you look at Homer, Homer or you look at ancient India or ancient China, they've all got little altars in their home. And they never, no civilized person, look at, read the Iliad and the Odyssey, no civilized person ever thinks, I will just drink water because it's for me, or I'll just eat what I want because it's for me. That's considered like an animal or like a barbarian in the bad sense. We must have some sense that whether it's God or Mother Nature or the gods or however we see that, that there's other people involved. This is their idea. Now, the videos that you're about to see, I think, will show that whether they're right or wrong, it's, it works. <laughs> anyway, hit us to the next slide. Is this video, oh, this is, this is our water. Okay. So, this is very interesting. This is, when I first saw this, this is when I started, I, I completely took... Uh, I made a conscious effort to stop swearing in the village and even once in a while if I'm in some bureaucratic meeting that's frustrating me, I don't swear myself. This is when I started calling, hey beautifuls and these kind of things. I started to become <laughs> mindful of it. Because I watched a lot of videos on this. Uh, this gentleman's name is Emoto, Masaru Emoto, and since that time there's been many, many, many studies on this. Jasmine is suggesting that we do our own study here. See what happens? So we might do that. The crystal one is going to be tough because you have to put it in negative 20 degrees for three hours and then negative five and get a microscope, take cameras. I don't know. The rice. The rice we can do. So we will we'll look at that. So this is pretty self-explanatory. What he does is he takes water from one source. So all ten of these slides are one source of water, just a bucket of water from a, one particular place. Then he separates it uh, into little, um, sometimes jars, sometimes he'll put five cc's, which is just like a drop, onto slides. He does different things, but he splits up the water. And then usually, he, he uses jars, he'll then put a word on the outside of the jar. So when it says the word angel, that means there's a jar of water sitting there, and it says angel on it. That's all it is. Then a jar of water, same water, says peace on it. Then a jar of water, spirit, and you can follow the rest. 
some of these were, were played in music. Uh, and then he takes those and he puts them at negative 20 degrees for three hours uh, until it's frozen. Then he takes it out and he puts it in a still a cold room, but not as cold. And the scientists come in with their microscopes. They look at it under a microscope and they take photos. And this is what the photos are. So the idea here, and we'll explore this even more in our next class, is that consciousness or intention or what we speak or say or think is affecting matter. And for the last half a century or 60 years, say, in quantum physics, this is, um, this is the cutting edge. And we'll explore that. And we'll see videos of different quantum physicists and their experiments and different things. It'll be interesting for you, I think. So I think you get, everybody gets this right? What's going on here? So we're going to watch a short little video which Jasmine kindly made for us. This next series of photographs of the work of Japanese researcher Mr. Masuru Emoto from his book, The Message from Water. Mr. Emoto's work provides factual evidence the human vibrational energy, thoughts, words, ideas, and music affect the molecular structure of water. Please remember that water comprises over 70% of a mature human body and covers the same amount on our planet. Water is the very source of all life. This photo shows the beautifully formed geometric design of the Yushi Spring water. This next photo is from the Shimanto River, the last green spring in Japan. Notice the extraordinary geometric forms. The fact that the molecular structure of water can be affected by our consciousness, our intent, and our sounds is extremely important. This photo is from the Mount Cook Glacier in New Zealand. Mr. Moto has been visually documenting these molecular changes in water by means of his photographic techniques. He freezes droplets of water, then examines them under a dark field microscope that has photographic capabilities. His work clearly demonstrates the diversity of the molecular structure of water and the effects of the environment upon the structure of the water. This photo is from the fountain. Lords, France. This photo is from contaminated water from the Yodo River in Japan. In this photo, we can compare the contaminated water with clean stream water. Look at the difference. Mr. Amoda decided to see what effects music would have upon the structure of water. He placed distilled water between two speakers for several hours while playing different music and then photographing the crystals that formed after the water was frozen. This photo is of water being exposed to Beethoven's Pastorale. This photo is the effect of box air with a G-string on the water. This photo is water exposed to Chopin's farewell song. This next photo is water being exposed and affected to music that was designed for healing. This photo is of water being exposed to the Kawachi folk dance. This photo shows the effect of heavy metal music on the water. Here now we can compare the effects of healing versus heavy metal music and what happens to the water molecules. Mr. Omoto decided to see how thoughts and words affected the formation of untreated distilled water crystals by typing words onto paper and then taping this paper onto glass bottles overnight. This photo shows the effects of the words, thank you. This next photo shows the effects of the words love and appreciation. 
this photo shows the effects of the word. You make me sick, I'll kill you. And here we can compare the effects of thank you with you make me sick, I'll kill you. Very, very different geometric forms being occurred through the attention. Now this photo is of a very polluted and toxic water from the Fujiwara Dam. Here now is the same water from the Fujiwara Dam after a Buddhist monk had offered a prayer over it. <coughs> prayer, that sound coupled with intention, seems to have an extraordinary ability of restoring water to its natural, harmonious, geometric symmetry. And in this photo we can compare the toxic water and then the effects of praying over the water. <coughs> <laughs> so, I think it's pretty self-explanatory, isn't it? The, yeah. Oh. The, the ramifications we may consider is what is our internal dialogue, for example. How do we think of ourselves? What do we say to ourselves in here? Why did we do that? Do we feel shame? Do we feel guilt? Do we sometimes have some self-hate, some self-loathing? Do we say stuff to us, ourselves, like, oh, you idiot, why did you do that? Or do we cultivate some healthy internal dialogue? Forgiveness, kindness, love. Sometimes, actually, we treat others better than we treat ourselves. Also, when we're dealing with others, and in the future, many of us will also have children, I think it's a, a valuable fund of knowledge to have sort of imprinted into our hearts and minds. It makes us much more, more mindful. How do we deal with, if we were brought up in the normal Western world, we're brought up surrounded by people who swear. And we ourselves, I imagine. You know, I was doing that in kindergarten. <laughs> I won't give examples, but you know. <laughs> so. How do we want to approach speaking, speaking when we understand this? Speaking both internally, you know, without external noise, the way we're speaking in here, and the way we project our thoughts and our intentions through words, now becomes magic. It becomes a force. It becomes uh, enchanted. We are casting spells every time we open our mouth. We are shifting. We're changing the environment. We're changing each other. So as we become mindful of that, it is interesting to imagine what kind of communities and families we could create understanding this. So this one was a few minutes long. We have one other one that's very short, and then uh, we'll bring this class to a close. Antonio, or whoever is there, Bruno? Dr. Emoto has conducted another... This is the experiment which we may do. He placed rice into three glass beakers and covered it with water. And then every day for a month, he said, thank you to one beaker. You're an idiot to the second. And the third one, he completely ignored. If, if you missed that, because it is quiet, he said thank you to the first one, you are an idiot to the second one, and he ignored the third one, purposefully After one month, ignored it. The rice that had been thanked began to ferment, giving off a strong, pleasant aroma. The rice in the second beaker turned black. That's the idiot rice. <laughs> and the rice that was ignored began to rot. Dr. Emoto thinks that this experiment provides an important lesson, especially with regard to how we treat children. We should take care of them, give them attention, and converse with them. Indifference does the greatest harm. Okay. <laughs> Hit the next slide. So, this is the final slide of this class. And this is something, this is not exactly food, but this is something that's been going on in India at least 
over the horizon of time. So even in the oldest literature, perhaps 3000 or 3100 BC, or a little bit older than that, uh, even for them, this had been going on over the horizon of time, as long as they knew about history at that time. So many, many thousands of years. This is Tilak. Who here has been to India? So many of you have. You'll see like, like Shaivites with three stripes here. You'll see all sorts of different Vaishnav markings. Some people will do the shell and the disc and the club. Some people will write mantras on themselves. They, they have this uh, thing, like the Hare Krishnas here. They are doing, uh, their prayers are names of, <laughs> names of Krishna, which have very sort of positive meanings. So they'll say, Om Keshavaya Namaha, that you see that marking that they have there? Om Naranaya Namaha, Om Madhavaya Namaha, Madhava means sweet. Om, hmm, Om Govindaya Namaha, Om Vishnavaya Namaha. And they have 13 places on their body where they're putting, this, this tilak is clay, you know, clay from the banks of the Ganges, usually. Sometimes it's from some other holy place. Now you see this, they sell it everywhere in India, little things of tilak. Uh, so they're taking clay from the banks of a holy river every day as their standard thing after they bathe, after they shower or get out of the river or whatever they're doing, and they mark their body, just like he's marking a jar with thank you or this or that, they are marking their body with prayers and holy uh, earth. This is their, their culture. And they're, they're, what they're trying to do is create the body as a pure temple. Anyway, I think that's enough for today. Some interesting ideas. We have, um, there's actually about 15 or 20 minutes left, but maybe we'll, we'll give a little bit of an early mark. However, maybe we can do five minutes um, if there's any questions. Uh, yeah. With the um, power of intention. Yeah. So swearing, uh, do you feel like, <clears throat> when, I, when I thought about it, I feel like, Obviously, uh, the word only has the meaning that we put within the word. Therefore, if you if you swear, um, but it's part of your language as a good intention, can that is, is that still negative? It's very interesting, isn't it? If you look at swear words, a lot of them aren't. A lot of them are just the actual word is kind of, you know, a little bit rough. But some of them are. Yeah. Uh, my parents are Christian missionaries, and they're very conservative, so their friends are like. In America, especially, some of the swear words they use are just funny. They're just like, I don't know how to say it. I, I'm trying to think of one, but I remember thinking as a kid, geez, these guys are so goofy. They're sort no. of like, you know what I mean? That's a swear word, goofy. Yeah. Uh, they're just so, uh, I don't know how to say it. <laughs> nice. They're so nice, you know? <laughs> they're so like, Nice, conservative, middle-aged, middle-class people. Anyway, that was my parents' crowd. Uh, so I guess it depends. I guess it depends. Like some, people say, some people say, some people say, ah, Jesus. <laughs> so that's kind of, the actual word is kind of pretty. Yeah, exactly. This, this is my point. Yeah. Um, some people friends. say, like, God damn it. That's kind of harsh if yeah. you think about it. <laughs> yeah. uh, my friend's dad would uh, he used this expression, and he, he didn't actually know what it meant, he, and he would, he would say, oh, don't be a silly nonce. And in England, that, that, that basically means pedophile. He didn't, know, he didn't know that's what it meant. So he would always use it. And he's such an amazing guy. You know? he had no, there was no negative intention at all. Like, this guy, would never, he would never say any swear words. So for me, I felt like, surely there can't be a negative intention applied to that. Therefore, yeah, if they don't even know what you, the word yeah, is. Yeah, right? you put inside of it. But it's I would tend to go with that for you. My, yeah, I think, is it not tone of voice? Because you could go, oh, you're so ugly. You <laughs> know that it was ugly if you said it like that, you know? Try it. See how it goes. <laughs> Whatever are the details, uh, we can probably feel it out, you know, with our own hearts, some of our own. I'm also new to this. I only came across this a couple of years ago. So, you know, let's just approach it with common sense and with some creativity. And I, I bet you. If we do this for a couple of weeks watching different shows like this, we'll become more mindful as a community, as, as friends, and as we go off on our adventures. 
it will stick with us, I think. Ooh. Any, anything else? Sarah G? What, uh, what about, uh, maybe it's going to be another, another huge topic, not, maybe not today, but what about raw food and what about the way the temple cooks? <laughs> I, I would say I would say that you're going to get into the the Thomas Rajas Sattvic thing. Uh, okay. So generally, here's well, what we can do is we'll, we'll actually go to the literature itself. For example, like uh, if something is not good for your health, it cannot be sattvic. Yet, the devotee community and the yoga tradition in general, which the devotees are just a part of is supposed to cook sattvic. It's what Krishna asked for. So, I tell him that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I raise it at advisory board meetings. Gradually, I think we're winning. Mm -hmm. Gradually. Another thing that Krishna says in the Gita, because I'm not trying to quote just Krishna, but the Gita is one of the main texts that talks about the modes, so naturally. He says, what is it? Too dry, too sour, too salty, uh, too pungent, too hot, these kind of things. When it's excessive, so like if you look at India today, it's like one of the hottest foods oh. on the earth. So if it's too hot or too dry, like say potato chips or things, those are considered passionate. They kind of taste good, you have a good immediate effect, and the long-term effect on your health is bad. Mm. Little good, lots of bad. Sattvic can sometimes be a little bad and lots of good. Just to be honest, Krishna says that. It can be a little poison in the beginning, but the long-term effect is positive. So when we try to do something like uh, watermelon or whatever, you know, whatever we're finding is healthy for us, sometimes it can take some discipline. The same thing that happens to me sometimes when my alarm clock goes off. You know, there's a little bit of like, ah, and then you, you get through that, just that little bit of what Krishna calls poison, and then you experience it in a great pleasure for a long time. And foods or anything in Tamagun is unhappiness from beginning to end. Just the whole thing is just madness, and depression, and sloth, and laziness, and unhappiness. Anyway, so I think, I think what's happening there, just to get into that for one minute, is what we call uh, In sociology, like if you listen to sociology lectures, especially in world religions, they'll sometimes say that religions or ideologies, could be a political movement or whatever, but in this case a religion, travels in ethnic vehicles or travels in cultural vehicles. That's the tendency of how humans work. So say when Buddhism spread east, uh, you get... Um, language spreading east, Sanskrit. You get words like jujitsu or Zen, which are Sanskrit words or coming from Sanskrit words. You get that orange dress, you know, representative of a monk that didn't exist before in the Far East, but when Buddhism traveled. In other words, the dress has nothing to do with the real spiritual life, but the religion tends to travel with some of these externals. Now look at the case in point up here. The Dodi actually comes, the dhoti is the bottom half of what the men wear. That comes, we can trace that historically. It comes from the Ram Krishna mission, which is only like 100 years old. And, you know, it was just one group. But somehow or other, it got pulled into our tradition. The kurta, kurta, as I was telling some of our girls before, kurta is just the Persian word, the Arabic word for shirt. The kurta comes from the Middle East. Maybe, maybe 1100 A.D., 1000 A.D., something like that. So it's coming into the culture. Now, because we've forgotten about that, we now assume it's part of Vedic culture or yoga culture. But well, it's not. <laughs> the particular instruments, the particular types of food, the particular architecture, the language, the clothes, they're all external. They're not the real thing. But uh, religions and ideas tend to travel with these things. So, now food. In West Bengal, they eat like this. I live there. That's how they eat. Rice, dal, chapati, sabji, halva, like that. Halva comes from Turkey. Yet, now it's part of, like the harmonium that came from 
Some people say the British, some people say the Germans, but it de didn't come from India. But now it's an Indian instrument, harmonium. You know that thing with the, mm -hmm. yeah. So there's yoga and then there's Indian ethnic culture. They are completely different, but sometimes you see them traveling together. So because Hare Krishna is a very kirtan-centric, you know, kirtan going all the time, centric uh, tradition, branch of Hinduism, the main kirtan force in India is East India. Mayapur is the center of all that. That's where I was living. Uh, that's why I went there. Like many, 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 many times I've had kirtans with 5,000 or 10,000 people. Many, many times. Daily, almost. At least in, the, in that time of the year. Uh, so we're getting a culture coming from East India and just so happens we're eating like they do in East India. Not like they do in South India. Not like they do in Rajasthan. But what they do in East India. You follow this? So, if we're intelligent, if we're educated, we can separate true spirituality from the externals. We still may use externals, because sometimes they're helpful, but we never want to lose track of what's what. <laughs> Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Actually, it's very helpful in today's <laughs> world, because you want to be able to work with different... If I go to church with my parents, I want to be able to enter into that. I don't want to lose myself in the externals and think, oh, this is bad. No, I can open-heartedly go to church with them and sing Amazing Grace or uh, What a Friend We Have in Jesus or any of those Hillsong songs, which are great. I can do that and I can access my own spirituality through their uh, process. Is that okay? And all of us can do that. Wherever we go, however we do it, we can fully put our hearts into a Hare Krishna Kirtan and then a week from now, we can be with Kevin James and Byron Bay. Another week after that, who knows where we are doing who knows what. <laughs> but we can, uh, we can access our spirituality if we can differentiate between externals and internals. Is that okay? Let's call it a day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And the backs of your heads and the fronts will be on YouTube. Hey.